um, can we put the cereal back? Oh, no, no, no. I've got it. This morning, you might say, we go into extra innings for our series we have been calling Follow Along. Let me explain. All summer, we've been looking at people who dramatically followed God. And having dramatically followed God, God responded with some pretty amazing miracles. And a couple weeks ago, I realized, you know what, there's one more story. There's one more story we need to tell to bring a final piece to this journey of following Jesus because this is the last guy who would place his faith in Jesus before Jesus completed what he did on the cross for us. Now this is interesting. I don't know if you've caught on to this, but over the summer we've spanned many books of the Bible Thousands of years, many people who place their faith in God. But one of the distinctives of all the people we've looked at this summer is they did place their faith before Jesus finished what he came to do. Here's why it's important. One of these days, you're going to have one of your kids or maybe a friend, or maybe this question will arise to you and you'll be like, hey, like how did the people in the Old Testament get saved? Like, what did you have to do to get right with God back before Jesus went to the cross? What did it take? The answer is really simple. The same thing it takes for you and I to be in a right standing with God. You see, it's by grace through faith. For the people in the Old Testament, they were believing God that he would keep his promise to send the Savior of the world. For us, we're believing God kept his promise. For them, it was the Savior will. For us, it is the Savior has. And today, we get to look at the final person who believed right before Jesus completed it. We commonly call him the thief on the cross. Now, you, you, you may be asking yourself, okay, All right, Michael, that's kind of interesting. Like, that's a fun Bible trivia question. Like, if I go out to eat today and somebody asks me, who's the last person to believe in Jesus before Jesus completed the work on the cross? I'll win the Bible trivia game. But we're not here to do Bible trivia, are we? We're here because God's Word is living, active. It brings life. It brings hope. And and let me just, let me be really straight with you today. I genuinely believe that this account of what happened while Jesus was being crucified has the potential to change your life, specifically change how you see everyone around you and maybe even how you view yourself. So let me give you a question just to kind of just kind of to mark as we begin our journey. Here it is. Who's your criminal? Who is your criminal? Now go ahead and give you a little tip. Who's that person you've written off? Who's that person you thought went too far? Or who's that person you've said, no way? Who's your criminal? That's our journey for today. All right, so let's jump into God's Word. If you have your Bible or Bible app, please join me in Luke 23. Luke chapter 23. And already as Leanne presented our scripture for today's worship, you may have already connected the dots and realized what part of the story we're talking about. We are talking about Jesus' crucifixion, the actual day, the actual site, the actual event of Jesus being crucified. We jump in in verse 26 of Luke 23. So third gospel, 23rd chapter, 26th verse. We'll throw the first one up on the screen while you're opening And as they led him away, speaking of Jesus, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, 
who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Now, but before we talk about the specific scene of Jesus' crucifixion, let's talk context. We're, t- we're talking about Jerusalem. What was it like in Jerusalem on this day? It was the week of Passover. That meant there were people everywhere. That's why we have a guy from modern-day Libya, which is North Africa, a town back then they called Cyrene. His name is Simon. Simon, like thousands of others, were in Jerusalem to worship God, to celebrate God's goodness in the celebration of the Passover that he delivered his people from slavery in Egypt thousands of years before. The city was packed. So get your mind wrapped around this. It was like Panama City Beach during spring break. It was like a city hosting the Olympics or the Super Bowl. And they tell me it's going to be like that in southern Illinois during the solar eclipse next month. All right, just get get your mind wrapped around. There are people everywhere. Now back to Jesus. Why was it? That Simon of Cyrene, this foreigner come back home to worship God, why is he carrying the cross? None of the gospel writers specifically call it out. It can be easily deduced. Jesus is physically unable to carry the cross. And when we say the cross, probably it was just the horizontal part of the cross not the vertical and horizontal. It would have been about 100 pounds, 75 to 125 pounds. So why couldn't Jesus carry a cross? Was he out of shape? Was he a weakling? No, he was fit. He was strong. He was very accustomed to walking many, many miles per day. He couldn't carry the cross because of what's transpired in the last 12 hours. If you're familiar with the story of what Jesus did for us, you know that things got really hairy the night before. It's about 12 hours before this scene that Jesus is in the garden alone praying, Father, let this cup pass before me, but not my will, yours be done. He prayed in such anguish that his sweat glands leaked blood. It was horrific because he knew what was coming. Leaving the garden, he was betrayed, denied, and abandoned by his best friends. Having been arrested, he was then put on trial sometime after midnight in a trial that was illegal, during which false witnesses were brought in, paid, told to lie about Jesus. Ironically, sometime before 6 a.m., they condemned him of blasphemy and beat him, blindfolded him, and punched him in the face, spat upon him. By 6 a.m., they're dragging him to one of the Roman officials over that area. His name was Pilate. Pilate doesn't find anything wrong, sends him over to Herod. Herod kind of acquits him and says, hey, he's not my problem, sends him back to Pilate. Four times, Roman officials acquit or declare him innocent. In verse 22 of this chapter of Luke, Pilate says, I'm going to have him punished and then set him free. Pilate knew he had done nothing to deserve anything, but hey, if I get him beaten, maybe the crowd will calm down. What was the punishment? The most horrific beating you can even imagine. I don't even think we can get our minds wrapped around the egregious beating that they called scourging. Two Roman soldiers would be given the task of beating a naked man whose hands had been tied to a post. Hitting him from both sides, a left-hander and a right-hander. On this flagrum, the the whip that they used, there would be tiny little bones and weights so the bones would sink into his flesh. And so these Roman soldiers 
we're trained at how to rip the flesh off the backside of a human being. They got through his flesh, and you can imagine pieces dangling off Jesus' back. They probably got into the muscle and began to tear that tissue free. Jesus is beaten bloody and has now lost pints of blood. Why is he weak? Not because he's a weakling, not because he's less of a man, but because of what has happened to him in the last 12 hours. Now back to Panama City Beach. Because it's essential to understand just how disgusting this scene is. Look down in verse 34. They bring Jesus to the side of the crucifixion. He willingly stretches out his hands where the soldiers pin his hands and feet to the cross. And what's going on around? And they, speaking of the soldiers, halfway through verse 34, cast lots to divide his garments. So having pinned Jesus' body to the cross, the guards start gambling for his clothes. Verse 35, and the people stood by watching. Now, there are lots of different ways we watch. We can be bird watching. We can be, you know, there's lots of different watchings. What what was this? This was the word that's used when you're referring to a spectacle. This is a word that denotes entertainment is before my eyes. You see, the crucifixion of Jesus was designed by the Romans to be a party to to participate in and a spectacle to watch. Fleming Rutledge did her work on the crucifixion. Let me read you an excerpt from her book. She said, Crucifixion as a means of execution in the Roman Empire had as its express purpose the elimination of victims from consideration as members of the human race. It was meant to indicate to all who might be toying with subversive ideas that crucified persons were not of the same species, either of their executioners or the spectators. They were expendable and deserving of ritualized extermination. Therefore, the mocking and the jeering, catch those words? The mocking and the jeering that accompanied the crucifixion were not only allowed, they were the part of the spectacle programmed into it. One last piece. Everyone understood that the specific role of the passerby was to exacerbate, make it worse, the dehumanization and degradation of the person who had thus been designated as the spectacle. The Romans had set it up such that the crowd who was walking by Panama City Beach would look at at persons being executed and think, yep, that's what ought to happen. Yep. Those people aren't even human. Like, I wouldn't even think about being compassionate to that person who is writhing in pain and gasping for air because they do not even deserve to be alive. They're not even human. Jesus, innocent, wrongly accused, wrongly convicted, now wrongfully being executed, is the spirit spectacle for the crowd. If you were Jesus, what is your reaction to the crowd? Jesus' reaction is so notable, they comprise some of the most famous words he uttered from the cross. And here they are. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, before you get a warm feeling in your stomach, let's talk about who the they is. 
when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, he was talking about the religious leaders who had decided that any means necessary was appropriate because the end of ending Jesus justified the means. False witnesses, justified. Illegal trial, justified. Make up kind of a mock charge as we take him to the Roman ruler so we can get him dead the way we want him dead? Justified. People who claim to be godly, willing to do whatever it took to get a guy murdered that they hated. And Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Them included the guards, the soldiers who mercilessly pinned Jesus' body to the cross gambling over his clothing while they watched him writhe in pain and gasp for air, laughing that one of them was about to score his clothes. The them included the crowd. Dad standing there with their little boys, eating, laughing, pointing, Them included two criminals. Matthew and Mark in their Gospels tell us that both criminals joined in the railing. But can you imagine the, the guts of two guys being crucified with Jesus to jump in attacking Jesus? Father, forgive them. Jesus prayed. Can you imagine? See, usually we give ourselves an out, right? Like we justify ourselves for a little bit. Somebody hurts us. Somebody who makes fun of us. Somebody stabs us in the back. Somebody jeers. Somebody laughs. Somebody, like we give ourselves some time. We'll say things like, okay, I'm going to forgive him, but like I'm going to be ticked off for a while. Like, I, hey, God, God's not going to be upset with me if I'm mad for a while because that, you know, what they did, you know, I, I'll get over it, but right now I'm just totally ticked and I'm justified being ticked. Like, I hate her. Just for a little while. I recently read the book uh, Originals by Adam Grant, and, and they talked about how we even have this psychological coping thing that we, like, we'll tell our boys, like, if you're really upset, just, like, get it out of your system. Like, Go punch the wall or scream in the pillow. I mean, just like, get it out. And Adam Grant is talking about how psychologically damaging that is because it puts our focus on the perpetrator. Like it puts all of our focus on the person who hate us, or who hurt us, excuse me. And Adam Grant says, what you really need to do is put your focus on the victim. Like yourself or maybe others who got hurt. That's a good step, but do you realize what Jesus did? He took another step. He, he didn't just focus on the victims, but he saw the perpetrators as victims. Father, forgive them. He saw them being perpetrated by hate. He saw them being the victims of just this vile hatred and despising him. They were ate up spiritually by Satan who has incited them. He didn't just focus on those being hurt like himself. He focused on praying for those who were doing the hurting because they too were victims. So Jesus on the cross praying for those who were hurting him right then. Jesus on the cross praying for us. Pastor Eli said this week, he's like, there's 1 John 2. Jesus is our advocate. Like, Jesus is putting a good word in for us with the Father. He was doing it on the cross. While the spikes were still in his hands, while he was gasping for air, while he was writhing in pain, while others were mocking and laughing at him, he prayed for them. So when Jesus says, hey, um, those who are forgiven, forgive. He means it, and he did it. He's not asking us to do anything he did not do.
So Jesus asked the Father to forgive. Does God do anything? Doesn't look very good at first. Look in verse 35. We see the first response after Jesus' prayer. The people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed. Jesus is praying for them. But they just continue to scoff, sneer, hate. And they say, he saved others. <laughs> Let's see him save himself. Next one, verse 36. The soldiers mocked. Oh, are you hurting up there? How you doing? Hey, the sign above your head says you're king of the Jews. <laughs> so if you're any king at all, why don't you just hop down off there? No, sorry. One of the criminals, now verse 39, who were hanged, railed at him, adding, Are you the Christ? Come on! If you're the deliverer, deliver yourself and, hey, take me with you. It's interesting that all three, rulers, soldiers, and the criminal, were saying, hey, Jesus, come on, dude. You said you were something else. Prove it by getting off the cross. Come on, we'll believe you, whatever. Let's, show, let's see it, dude. Let's show me. But his staying was what showed us who he really is. When we were in um, Destin with our little ones last week, uh, the movie 42, story of Jackie Robinson, first African-American to play Major League Baseball, was, was on one of the movie channels. And I watched watch the movie and, oh my goodness, as a, as a father of three white kids and two black kids, it was gut-wrenching to watch. And just the... The, the hatred, the venom, the abuse that he took because of the color of his skin was sickening. They, they portray his, his first day, his debut in Major League. It was the then Brooklyn Dodgers that he played for against the Phillies. And the manager of the Phillies is just letting him have it. I mean, it was disgusting what he was saying. And after three times, Robinson's not been able to get on base. And he, he goes in the dugout. He's, he's upset. He goes down into the tunnel behind the dugout. And he's got his bat. And he is shattering the bat. I mean, my hands are just hurting watching the scene. And he's screaming. He's upset. And just pounding this bat into the wall. And the owner comes down. And, and Jackie's like, what kind of a man am I? And he, he then says, the next white man who, and blankety blank, I'm going to, blankety blank. He was just furious, just out of control emotionally. And part of his anger was justified. It was evil what he was facing. And what he was saying is, if I'm a real man, I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to set this thing right. They're going to see who I really am. And of course, the owner said, Jackie, Jackie, you can't do that. Because it, then it won't be that you were incited. It will be that you, a black man, did what was wrong. Show them the man that you are by getting on base. Jesus showed who he really was by staying on the cross. By paying for our sins. It would not have shown us he is the Christ by him getting off the cross because those spikes were not holding him on the cross. His love for you and me were holding him on the cross. The fact that he was on a mission to save us from our sins kept him on the cross. Because at any moment he could have called on the legion of angels who were pleading with him for them to take him off. At any moment he could have just stepped off like he walked through doors a few days later. But his love compelled him to stay. Our salvation being at stake. The first indicators are not very good. He stays. And people continue to reject. 
violently. Until we get to verse 40. Take a look. But the other rebuked him. All right, so this is the other criminal rebuking the first criminal who's saying, hey, if you're the Christ, hop down and take me with you. Do not, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. The criminal says, do you not fear God? You're about to meet your maker. Do, like, do you not care about God? Like we will one day stand in front of here and today is our day. Do, do not fear God. And would you shut your mouth? Because we deserve this. I mean, you you got to let this soak in for a second. This man being hanged next to Jesus is saying to the other dude being hanged next, next to Jesus, dude, we're scumbags. We are scumbags. That whole Roman design of us being a spectacle on display for everybody to say, man, I don't want my kid to end up there. We deserve to be here. We deserve this. We are not innocent. We deserve everything that's coming to us. You see, that's, that's the first step of experiencing the gospel. That step, not a very fun step, of realizing, I'm a mess. Like even on your best days, you still fall short. On your worst days, you don't want to even talk about it. We fall short. Compared to God, we're scumbags. And this thief is saying, dude, you, do you not realize we're getting exactly what we deserve? But this man is innocent. He does not deserve to be here with us. And then in the next verse, he says to Jesus and reveals step two in experiencing the gospel when he says, Jesus, When you come into your kingdom, remember me. The second step of experiencing the gospel is faith. He was declaring that Jesus was king of the kingdom. He was saying, Jesus, hey, when you take your rightful seat on the throne, just remember me. Remember me. He was declaring faith in the king of the kingdom. Father dramatically answered Jesus' prayer because you remember, both thieves started the crucifixion railing at Jesus. Now one thief, by the grace of God, has been brought to life. And there are a bunch of you in the room that remember when that happened to you. Maybe a day, maybe a season of your life. You can't even tell me what month it was or maybe even not, not what year it is, but you remember when it happened to you because prior to that, you just didn't care. Like, go to church, maybe, if you can score a chick or look good. But like, you, you, you didn't care. And then something happened in you. Something happened that brought you to life. You, you did care. You actually found yourself listening to someone teach about the gospel and you, you, you said, like, I believe that. I believe Jesus is the gift of God provided for me the payment that I could be saved. I believe that Jesus went to the cross and faced hell so I don't have to. I believe that. Something happened in you. God gave you the gift of faith. That's what happened to this man. That is what happened to this man. And as we look at this story, it should blow us away because saving faith came to the least deserving person at the last possible moment. And some of you have wondered if you've gone too far or if it's too late. 
And I'm telling you what. If the guy who deserved to be executed and dehumanized and treated as if he was not even human at his own testimony was in a position to receive God's grace just before he finished dying, you're within the reach of grace. It's what makes it grace. And then this story gets really challenging. Because just as much as there's not a person in the room who's less deserving of grace than this thief, there's not a person in the world who is less deserving than you for experiencing grace. And God hit me with that Last week, on the beach, in Destin. And here's how he did it. My two little ones were, were fishing. Let me show you a picture. Now I need to give you two little kind of context pieces for this story. Number one, we end up in Destin, and it's a little bit more wavy than normal. We got there at night, drove all day. You've, some of you have done that. And so we got there, it was basically dark, but we went down and kind of looked, and there were significant waves coming in, but again, we were just looking at the water, a storm had gone across the Gulf. But oh, that's awesome, we'll come back in the morning. We, we got back in the morning, and I, you know, I, I'm, I don't know much about the ocean, but it was rank with seaweed. You know, I guess the storm kind of blew in all the, I mean, it, it looked like a mossy pond in southern Illinois. It was one of those, you're like, I don't know if I want to jump in kind of deals, all right? So the kids, they didn't care. They're jumping in. We're like, yeah, go on out there, you know, enjoy. <laughs> just, just mossy stuff everywhere. And it, it, it's, it, it was stinking. So, so that was day one. Day two, we come back. We're like, you know, how long does it take the ocean to clear out the, 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 the stanky seaweed kind of stuff? And, and we got down there. We're like, hey, it's, it's starting to clear up. But now, wait a minute. Like, it looked like, so again, I don't know anything about seaweed, it looked like there were, like, big chunks of, like, stems, like a, some sort of underwater plant. Like, oh, that's interesting. So the, the seaweed stuff is kind of going away, but now there are these stems that have been washed up toward the beach. Until we got close to the water, it wasn't stems of seaweed. It was millions upon millions upon millions of little fish. Hence the picture. Just little bitty dudes. Little bitty fish. Second part I need to tell you. Um, I was raised to value the life of God's creation. So I, I was raised, hey, don't pull the wings off of bugs. And, and yes, we eat animals and, and take, you know, don't apologize for that. But if we're going to kill an animal, we're going to do it humanely. If an animal is suffering, we're going to put it out of its misery. So I was raised that way. And I've been quite proud to raise my children in the same way of, hey, we honor God's creation. We treat it appropriately. So as my kids are scooping fish out of the ocean, I'm like, okay, okay, come take the picture. Now put them back in the water. I, you, I know it doesn't make any sense, but they need the water to breathe and, you know, just throw them back in. You know, get, just put them back, please. They're dying, you know. Well, I, I began to watch and they're scooping them up and learning to put them back. And it's like, ooh, that hurt. But anyway, they're, they're trying to get them back out of their net and into the water. And, and then I notice little fishy getting stranded on the sand. It's probably my kid's fault or, you know, who knows. So, so now I'm on sand patrol or something. You know, I'm, I'm getting these little fish and, and tossing them back into the ocean and kind of watching. And, and I kind of proudly was doing it. And as I reached down to grab one of the little dudes I didn't hear it, but God may as well have whispered it in my ear. Hey, Michael, why do you care about that little fish more than you do about people who are on a path to destruction and will end up dying without me, without hope? Because I was kind of proud of saving fish. 
but I let myself off frequently when it comes to a, a neighbor or a fellow student or somebody in the community, you know, a co-worker kind of situation. And I thought, well, you know what it comes down to? This fish has never hurt me. And I started going through kind of some of the people, some of the situations that are personified by the people in this story, in this account of the crucifixion. And we come full circle back to our question, who's your criminal? Like, who is it that you'd rather save a fish from death on a beach than see that person in your life experience life through Jesus? Who's your criminal? Maybe, maybe it's somebody like the religious rulers. And that person or persons has been on a mission to destroy you. Like it was intentional. And they have been willing to stoop to any level because in their minds, the end justifies the means. You, you understand grace, right? The thief didn't deserve God's grace any more than you do. You don't deserve grace any more than that person you just thought of. That's what makes it grace. Will you do what Jesus did? Pray and share and love. Well, maybe, maybe it's not a religious ruler for you. I mean, how many of us have people that are actually on a mission to destroy us? Maybe it was more the soldiers. Maybe somebody wasn't on a mission to hurt you, but boy, they stabbed you in the back. As Jesus was pierced with those spikes, you've been pierced with that knife right in the back. Will you do what Jesus did? Will you, will you pray for them? Will you passionately ask God to save them because you no more deserve to be saved than they do? Maybe, maybe for you it's like the, it's like the crowd. I mean, you've, you've, you've been looking for sympathy, you've been looking for a friend, and, and you keep looking around, people are just laughing at you. People don't care. Will you do what Jesus did and pray for them? Will, will you understand that they deserve to be saved just as much as you did? And even go outside your comfort zone to tell them about your faith and what God has done in your life, even if they're going to make fun of you more? Or maybe for you it's a straight up criminal. It's somebody in your life and you've thought, man, that dude has just done it one too many times. She has taken one too many steps. She doesn't deserve... Neither did you. It is not too little, too late. Will you love them like Jesus loved you? It is n not too late today for them. And it is not too late today for you by the grace of God.